This morning we have a great example of a spiritual victory from Peter. And I'm excited to bring this to you all today because we need to study these examples and we need to learn from them because uh, we're in a spiritual warfare environment. And for anybody who feels like we're not or wants to pretend that we're not, uh, you're like a person that doesn't like the heat. And so after we finish today, you put on your muckalucks, your parka, your mittens and your hat, and you go outside to pretend that it's 25 degrees outside. And you open the door and you get smacked in the face with a bunch of reality. And that kind of reality is going to hit you in the spiritual realm if you don't understand and be prepared for spiritual battle. So I'm thankful to be able to bring this to you today. But for me to help you understand how Peter got this uh, victory, I need to uh, take a little bit more time on the introduction. So it's going to be a little bit longer than you might be used to, but I promise you we will get to our text and we'll read it and we'll go through it. So Peter used three primary ways to help him have this uh, victory. And to help you understand the three steps, I'm going to use an analogy from NASA going to the moon. So here we go, Dave's analogies. So NASA wanted to take man to the moon, and no one had done that before, so they had to invent this new navigational system that had to be robust to take the dynamic forces of liftoff, that had to maintain its course as it went through the atmosphere with jet streams and all kinds of crosswinds hitting on it. It had, to, it had to maintain its course with who knows what going into outer space. It had to keep control of this capsule that's going faster than a bullet. And then it had to maintain a precision control to land safely on the Earth, or the Moon, and then bring the astronauts back. So what NASA invented was called an uh, Apollo Guidance Computer. And this computer was extremely complex. It was uh, new technologies. It had all kind of dynamic software written into the code. It had a whole fleet of uh, technicians on the ground that would support it in mission control. It had other computers that were sending it data and had all kinds of things to help it maintain its course. And as complex as this computer system was, it still had to answer three basic questions that are known to all navigational systems. And these three basic questions align with the three steps that Peter used to get this victory. So let me drill down a little bit on what these three things are so we can understand them better. The first one is, what is up? All right. The second one is, where am I? And the third one is, where am I going? So let me explain that to you. If I ask all the kids in here, point to up, they're all going to point up. And you would be absolutely 100% correct. That is in relation to the fact that we're standing on Earth. And we know exactly where up is. But in space, there is no up. So if you go and launch your rocket and you don't know what up is, you are going to be severely lost. So you have to know what up is. Everything is predicated on your success knowing the truth of up. So the way NASA handles that is they put the rocket on the launch pad and they align its computers, its gyros, and its system to the known truth of up. Once it's aligned, then it can maintain its course because it knows how to correct and stay on track because it knows up, and it will take it all the way through, which it successfully did. The next question we have is, where am I? Well, when you have a journey, you have a starting spot and an end spot. So along the journey, you have all these, like, what they call waypoints. And there's strategic places where you can stop, look, and listen, and make sure that you're on track. If you need to make a correction, you do that. And as you go through this process, you, you understand, OK, I made a correction. Now, I'm going to do some strategy to get to the next waypoint, and then you just leapfrog your way all the way to the moon. One of the things that's really important about waypoints is you've got to be honest with the computer. If you tell the computer where you want to be, where you think you are, where you should be, but not where you are, uh, the computer's going to give you a bad correction. And then you're really going to be lost in space, and then you're going to be a part of a really corny TV show, but that's not important right now. The point is, is that you have to be honest with the computer because the computer knows the truth. And it's going to give you a correction predicated on that. And so you have to be honest with the computer. Also, these waypoints show that you're making progress. You're going forward. You're making uh, advancements. Uh, and that helps it understand how to do its corrections. When you're on the launch pad, you're 250,000 miles from the moon, you're going to have a huge correction. 
But as you progress, you're going to get fine-tuned and grow more and more closer to where you want to be so that when you're 30 feet off the surface of the moon, you have very precise uh, technical inputs to keep you safe. The next question is, where am I going? Well, that seems like a pretty obvious question. I'm going to the moon. But you can imagine all these computations that are busy and the, the computing power and the, all of this technical stuff, and you can lose the forest for the trees, so to speak. So you have to give the computer an understanding, where am I going? So the computer will say, OK, I'm going to the moon. All right, well, am I going further away from Earth? Yes. Am I getting closer to the moon? Yes. Do these numbers pass the sanity check? Yes. And then it can go back and do its fine tuning and make sure what's going on. It kind of helps keep everything in perspective. So now you might be wondering, well, Dave, thanks for showing us the Apollo uh, guidance computer system. That's great. What does that have to do with Peter? What does that have to do with the spiritual victory? What does it have to do with our text? And how in the world are you going to make this into a sermon? All good questions. I appreciate that. So why don't we take those three things, where am I, or excuse me, what is truth, where am I, and where am I going, and let's use an example, the best example that we have, to see how we might make those into a spiritual application. Uh, let's ask no other than Jesus Christ. So if we had Jesus here and we were going to ask him these questions, we would start with the first one. What is up? Well, if we know what up is, and kids know what up is, we're not going to insult Christ's intelligence and ask him what up is. We're going to redefine what that question is really asking. And that question is asking, what is truth? Now, I know today in society, uh, everybody has their own truth, right? Uh, and usually it aligns with whatever I want to do, that's the truth. Um, and you can make it anything you want. For example, um, you can defy physics. You can say, you know what, I'm rich and I want to do this. I want to go see the Titanic. So I'm going to make a submersible and I'm just going to say it's going to be safe and we're good. And that's my truth. And then you get smacked with reality. So there's all kinds of people out there that will give you truth, but they're false truths. And usually, you find out that it's a false truth after a catastrophic event. But there is a truth. And so we might ask Jesus, um, what is truth? You know, Pilate asked him, what is truth? And Jesus would say, well, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, OK, that makes sense. Well, it's God the Son, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God. God is truth. God is perfect, pure. There's no deceit in him. It, it, he's truth. So, okay, God is truth. Well, holy, uh, the Holy Spirit inspired holy men to write God's word. God's word is truth. Okay, so we have truth. For example, God made them male and female. That's a truth, right? The husband or the, the man will leave his mother and father, cling to his wife, and the two become one flesh. That's a truth. All right, so we have a truth. And Jesus is just totally in on this truth. He is, he is that truth, and he is right there with it. And that is what is critical for you to maintain your course. For example, remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan was uh, tempting him? Jesus is all God and all man. Being all man, he hadn't eaten for a long time. He was hungry. And then the devil starts throwing out words like bread. That could be distracting. That could even be tempting. So what was it that kept Christ on track because he never sinned? It was the word of God. He used the truth of God's word to defeat the devil. It's amazing. What about when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Only Jesus knew exactly what he was going to face when he went to the cross. I can read about it, I can understand it, I can perceive what the words say, but I can't relate to it. He knew what was going to happen when he took the wrath of God. It was powerful. So you can understand that there's this struggle. If this cup could pass me by, how was it that he fulfilled God's will perfectly? He never sinned. He never faltered. How did he do that? He was grounded in the truth. And he knew all eternity past, God had made a way for man to be redeemed, and it was through Jesus Christ. And it is so critical for us to be grounded in truth. If you're not grounded in truth, you're going to get blown around by every wave of doctrine there is. So that's the first question. What is truth? God is truth. God's word is truth. So the next question you might ask is, 
where am I? Right? And he asks Jesus, where are you? And he'll say, well, I'm in heaven. I'm with God the Father, and this is glorious. There's no sin, there's no sickness, and there's no sadness. This is absolutely incredible. It's great. Mm, great. But where are you? Ah, oh, well, see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will be saved. So I left the glories of heaven, and I came down to the low place of earth. I was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. I'm all God, I'm all man, and I'm sleeping in a manger. Oh, okay. Well, where are you? Well, I just got out of the water. John the Baptist just baptized me. A bird came down, it was a dove, landed on my head. And uh, God the Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I started my earthly ministry. So we can see that the route that God had predestined for Christ on his earthly ministry can be marked by these waypoints. Granted, Christ is perfect. He didn't need to make corrections. But at various places, he was greatly encouraged. And you can see his forward progress. That's an example for us. We don't just stand there, just stand there. We don't go in an orbit. This is the way God made me. I can't, I can't progress because this is it's not my fault. No, if you're a Christian, you're persevering. You're going towards the goal, just like Christ did. And you're honest with where you are on those waypoints. But anyway, then you might ask, well, where are you going? What, what is all this doing for you? And Jesus would say, well, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to take the wrath of God for you. I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to take the penalty that you can't. I'm going to pay the debt that you can't. Being all God, I can take the full and complete wrath of God for you. Being all man, I'm doing it for mankind that they have a way to be redeemed back to God. I'm going to the cross, but it's a blood sacrifice. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to give my life for you, my enemy, but I love you. Well, three days later, God is going to raise me from the dead. I'm going to have this huge victory over death. If anybody repents and believes, they can experience the fruit of that victory right then. Their heart of stone is taken out, their heart of flesh is put in, and they're reborn. This is an amazing thing. And then when they go through life and they physically die, they're going to see the natural outcome of that victory. And they're going to be with me in heaven forever. It's a beautiful thing. But then I'm going to ascend up in heaven, and I'm going to sit at the right hand of God the Father in a position of authority and power and victory. And then, at God's timing, I'm going to come back, and there's a second coming. It's going to be a day of judgment. It's going to be a beautiful day because on that day, everybody whose name is written in the book of life will be with me forever and ever in the new heaven and the new earth. But those whose name is not written in the book of life, they're going to be condemned to hell forever. They're going to be condemned to a place where the presence of God is no, not there. And you'll never be able to leave. So now we can see how these three questions have a spiritual application. It kind of works. But how does it work with Peter? Well, I need to give you some background so you can understand how we get to this climatic part in our text. So we're almost there, but not quite there yet. Luke wrote Acts. He wrote Acts as a letter to Theophilus to explain to him how the church started. And he picked up the letter when Jesus uh, got raised from the dead. Now, the believers were up in the upper room, and they're all praying with each other, and they're uh, probably encouraging each other, and they're probably, if they're like me, trying to piece all the parts together, because it's a lot happened really quickly. And Jesus appeared to them in the room. Now, I'm not really impressed that much that Jesus appeared to them. I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. But I'm impressed that Jesus knew that when he got arrested, the sheep were going to scatter, and they did. Can you imagine how lonely it is to go through all of that stuff that we just read about in our public reading alone? Wow. But yet he never faltered. He fully fulfilled scripture. He fulfilled God's will. And you know what? He could have done anything he wanted to. He could have gone to the far corners of the universe. He could have gone to the Bahamas and had a vacation. Jesus could have done anything he wanted to do. And what did he want to do? He wanted to come back to the low place of earth, 
back to Jerusalem, back to the upper room to his believers. He came back to them. Can you imagine how encouraging that must have been? Uh, they, they were probably hugging him and, and laughing and crying and excited and talking. And some of them maybe were embarrassed. Yeah, I ran away and hid. I got scared. And there was probably reconciliation, forgiveness, love. Man, it must have been awesome. But Jesus also gave him instructions while he was with them, eating and fellowshipping and everything. And he told him, not many days from now, the Holy Spirit's going to get poured out. I want you all to be together here in Jerusalem for when that happens. And uh, they were walking and talking, and he was uh, enjoying time with them. And as they were walking, he ascended up into heaven. And there he goes. He just floated right up into heaven. And, you know, the people are sitting there, is that him? Is that a bird? No, it's a cloud. I can't. Is he still there? And two angels showed up. And they're like, what are you guys doing? Jesus, it's amazing. He just, he just floated up into heaven. And they're like, well, yeah, yeah that's, that's what he said he was going to do. And I believe you have some instructions to follow, right? So they went back to Jerusalem, and they were in the upper room. And they did. They had some administrative work to do. They had to replace Judas Iscariot. Um, and so they found a guy that was, uh, met all the criteria to be an apostle. So they have now 12 apostles. And uh, they were praying with each other and talking with each other and encouraging each other. You're probably wondering, how in the world are we going to take the gospel out to the world? I mean, that's a huge task. Well, during this time, Jerusalem's getting ready for a festival, uh, Pentecost. And Pentecost is a celebration of when Moses got the uh, Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. And uh, it's a lead into the Passover. So all this is going on with all of these people from, are you ready, all over the world with these different languages coming into Jerusalem, right? You can see the plot. So as this was going on, the people in the upper room, the Holy Spirit did get poured out. And it was like an oaky storm, right? It wasn't calm. It wasn't gentle. It wasn't quiet. It was like last night. This wind comes in, and it's very clear something powerful is happening. And the, the people in the room, it was like these, these flames of tongues were coming down, landing on their heads. And when it landed on their heads, they could speak, uh-huh, foreign languages. And then the people on the ground were like, what is going on up there? And they were curious. And you have this marvelous merging of the people coming down, speaking the gospel in foreign languages, and the foreigners hearing the gospel in their native tongue. How incredible is that? And so Peter gets excited, right? And he starts to preach. And as he's preaching, Luke tells us that there was 3,000 people that believed. That to me is huge. That is huge. Your elders are very faithful to preach God's word. And as they preach God's word, they preach the gospel. And they plead that you would repent and believe for those that are not saved. And they've been doing it for years. Now, I'm thankful for every single one of you that are in here. And I know that God's a sovereign God, and he has everything in his plan. And some sow the seed, and some reap the harvest. I understand that. But after all these years, you get onesies and twosies. And we're thankful for it. But here, on this day, Peter got 3,000. Can you imagine if that happened here? Where would they park? Yeah, it's like, what in the world? And so he was very excited to bring the gospel. Well, then Luke tells us that the next day they wanted to go to the temple to pray. And they went to the temple. They went by the beautiful gate. And there's that guy that's always been there. He's a crippled guy. His friends take him every day. And uh, his legs don't work right or something. And uh, he begs for money because he can't work. I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit getting poured out. I don't know if it was the preaching. I don't know if it was the 3,000 people that believed. But whatever reason, Peter went back to this guy. And he's like, oh, I'm going to get some money. And Peter says, I, I don't have any money to give you. But what I do have, I freely give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And Luke tells us, because he has a medical slant to himself, how the guy's legs got strong and his feet got straight and his ankles were able to stand and he stood up. He didn't need any physical therapy. He didn't need any kind of walker. He was good to go. As a matter of fact, they say he was leaping, right? Well, now Peter and John have a new best friend, right? <laughs> and uh, so they go on into the temple. And where they go into the temple is called the portico. And Peter used this opportunity to preach the gospel again. And he's preaching the gospel to the people and that's where we get to our spot. So finally, we are ready to read our passage. It's in Acts chapter 4, and it's verses 1 through 22. And as is our custom here at Christ Fellowship Church, you would stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. 
And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Ananias the high priest, Cephas, and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated common men. They were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name." So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so, we have these three questions. What is up? Where am I? And where am I going? And that is the strategy that Peter used to have this incredible victory. So he knows that he's in spiritual warfare. And he's in the enemy's turf, right? And he's preaching the gospel. And you can see that. It says, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed. Why? Because they were preaching to the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection uh, uh, from the dead. So they were preaching God's word. They were preaching truth. And inside God's word, inside the truth, is the gospel. And they were preaching that. So they were, if, if you don't know what the gospel is by now, I'll give you a quick rundown. So there's a God He's a perfect, holy, just, pure God. And he has a requirement to get into heaven that man, being born under the curse of sin, cannot meet. We cannot do it. It's impossible. There's nothing that we can do to get into heaven. It won't work. And you might say to yourself, well, that sounds very judgmental. Who are you to say it won't work? Well, the Bible tells us there is no one righteous, no, not one. Well, hold on, Dave. That's a little spicy there. You're getting a little high horse. I mean, I was at the Sam's by Sheridan, and there was a homeless guy that would come up begging. And I made a deal with God that I would give him whatever bill came out of my pocket. And it was a tin spot. Well, I, I, don't, I don't care. It's not going to get you into heaven. Hey, don't get all judgmental. I'm not as bad as Saddam Hussein. And I'm, I'm probably ten times better than any politician in Washington, D.C. Well, that might be true. Okay, but that's not going to get you into heaven. And then you come up and you say, well, Dave, I donated 400 chairs to this church. I'm like, well, that does explain why we have so many chairs, but that's not going to get you into heaven. There's nothing that you can do to get you in heaven. You are doomed. We are all doomed. We need a savior. We need somebody outside of ourselves to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus left heaven, came down to earth. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was all God, all man. He never, ever sinned. He is that perfect and complete and final sacrifice. He went to the cross. He absolutely took the wrath of God for us. If you repent and believe, you are covered by his righteousness. 
and he had victory over death, and he ascended into heaven. That is the gospel. So Peter is preaching the gospel to these people. And there's a guy in the back, and he's hearing Peter preach. And Peter says that if anybody repents and believes, they can be saved. Uh Uh-oh. That doesn't jive with the Jewish thing. Hmm. And then he tells how God raised Christ from the dead and had this victory over death. Hmm. That doesn't jive with the Sadducees who don't believe in resurrection. So he ran around and he found the Sadducee. Are you hearing what Peter's saying to these people? He's preaching the good news. He's preaching truth. Did you hear this? So the Sadducee comes and he's listening. Oh, and he gets mad. He gets very mad. So he goes to the priest, who in my mind is a very scrawny guy and desperately needs to go out into the sunshine more often and probably has a high squeaky voice. And he says, do you hear the truth that this guy is preaching? This is unacceptable. And so he's like, okay, well, um, I have the rules to maintain order in the temple. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to get the captain of the temple because <laughs> he's not going to do it. And in my mind's eye, I see the captain of a temple as a very large individual with a hairy back, and he's probably a righteous bouncer, if you will. And so this group is coming towards Peter. Peter is preaching the gospel. He's giving the truth of God's word. He knows he's in the enemy's turf. He's buying up the time. And here they come. And Luke tells us that the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They didn't just waltz up there. They were greatly annoyed because they were preaching, they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus Christ the resurrection from the dead. What did not happen is the captain of the temple came up to him and said, Oh, you guys must be parched. You've been preaching all day. It's almost evening. Uh, Please come to this back room here. We have a big fluffy couch. We have a a ceiling fan, a large screen TV, and we have some fresh lemonade. No, they were greatly annoyed. The priest didn't come up and say, oh, thank you for giving us this theology. All the Old Testament is pointing to a redeemer. Praise God, hallelujah, it's Jesus Christ, and this salvation is available to all men. Thank you for preaching. Let's come back here and talk about it. For No. They, they, they had to arrest the situation. That's a military term. If you have some kind of kerfuffle going on, you find out what is the root cause, you arrest that, and you bring common order to everybody else. That's exactly what they did. Verse 3, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day because it was already evening. They had to get that out of there. They had to get the truth out of there. If you bring the truth to a worldling, you are going to get the following response. I'm offended. That automatically gives them the right to claim the next one. I'm a victim. That automatically gives them the next right. You are the problem. And finally, you must be silenced. Whenever you bring the truth to the world link, that's what you're going to get. So they arrested him and got it quiet. So now I have a question for you guys. And I'm going to be honest with you. This passage has been a huge admonishment to me the whole time. So I'm just sharing this with you because it, it, it hit me hard. What are you going to do when your pastor gets arrested? So I'm trying to be faithful to God's word. I'm trying to give you the, the tools that you need to equip the saints. We are in a spiritual battle. I'm being honest with you that what is happening out there, we need to be ready for. And this is live stream. And some guy out in live stream world gets offended. So what does he do? He calls the DOJ. Hey, you got some clown down there in Oklahoma, and he's preaching the truth. He's preaching God's word, and he's not holding in. He said God made them male and female. That offends me. He said that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's offensive. So what does the DOJ do? He calls the FBI. Hey, you got some guy down there in Lawton, Oklahoma, and he's preaching God's word. He's being faithful to it. What are you going to do? So all of a sudden, the field agents show up, and there's all these SUVs in the parking lot, and their lights are going. you got a SWAT team, and these guys come in with sunglasses and earwigs, right? And they come up here on stage, and they hold me over here. And they're saying, listen to me, people. Remain calm. It's okay. we got it under control. This man is telling you that nobody is righteous. No, not one. He's telling you that there's no way in and of yourself you can go to heaven. He's telling you that if you repent and believe, if anybody repents and believes in Jesus Christ, Jesus will save them and they will have the hope of heaven forever. This is totally unacceptable to this administration. And they take me away. Cindy doesn't know where I went. 
You don't know where I went. What are you going to do? Are you going to throttle back on the gospel? Are you going to come back on the truth? Are you going to water down the gospel? God is love. And just ignore that whole wrath thing? Are you going to compromise your faith and be all-inclusive? Well, if we just call them their personal pronouns and, and just, you know, be one like with everybody, what are you going to do? What did these people do? Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number of men came to about 5,000. They just witnessed Peter and John getting arrested and thrown into prison, which is nasty, and they believed. Wow. I got to tell you, I was greatly admonished. But how did Peter stay on track? He, he knew what was happening. He saw what was coming. How did he stay his course? He was grounded in the truth. The truth will set you free. So now the next question is, where are you? All right, you're on this route that God has for us, this predetermined path. They don't even know how many more waypoints they have. Maybe they're going to go see Jesus tonight. The people who arrested them can kill them. Where are you? Well, we see that in verses 5 through 12. On the next day, their rulers and elders and the scribes gathered together in Jerusalem and Ananias, the high priest, and Cephas, and John, and Alexander, and all who are the high priestly family. They're going to go in front of this board of inquiry. You've got to answer for yourself, buddy. What do you think being coming into the temple preaching the truth? Telling people that there is no one righteous, no, not one. That they have to have a Savior. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. What do you mean by talking like that? Well, that can be extremely intimidating. That, that could be something that might have you drift off course. Well, they're at a waypoint. Where are you? Well, they're in prison. <laughs> they're, in, they're in this stinky, nasty, awful place. But I believe that they had joy. Where are you? I believe that they're ruminating. I believe that they're thinking about their life with Christ. Christ came down. He gave good news. He was arrested. We give the gospel. We got arrested. We're following Christ's example. This is great. Where are you? Right? I believe that as they are sitting next to each other, they're encouraging each other and they're strengthening each other. Hey, I know it's intimidating. Hang tight, man. We can do this through God and His Spirit. This is a glorious thing. Hang tight. Be tight. That's why we need the church family. We need each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to strengthen each other. And we need to admonish each other. We need each other. You have to be a part of the church family to do this. Where are you? Well... These guys, they don't know if they're going to die. They have no idea. They don't know if they're going to get tortured. They have no idea. Where are you? It's incredibly intimidating to be in this situation. They could be scared for their lives. It was awful. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8. They are in God's love. What a better place to be. Oh, man. I don't care about the guy that can kill me. I'm praising God for saving me. They're in God's love. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. John 10. You're in Christ's hands. This is great. While you're making your path, you're at this waypoint. You make your corrections. But where are you? You're in God's hands. Now, this is incredibly intimidating, and it would be very tempting for them to waver. Like, you know, you see these people go on C-SPAN in front of a congressional hearing, and they change their tune. You can rest assured that the people that they were uh, worshiping to, uh, witnessing to, were kind of come back. They want to hear if they're going to keep the story straight. I used to work for a boss in the Air Force who was intimidating. He was, he was a jerk. And uh, thankfully, he got promoted and he left our squadron. But uh, before he left, uh, he, he explained himself. A lot of you all might wonder why I'm such a jerk. Yep. And so what would happen is you would go into his office and you have a great idea. And he would chew you up and spit you out. 
And it's like, what, wait, why did you do that? And he says, well, I figured that if you had enough moxie to stick with what you believed in and you put up with my personal insults and my bravement and, and just, you know, devil advocate and just being just intimidating, if you stuck with it and you could sell me on it, I'd back you all the way up the chain of command. Well, needless to say, I never went to the guy. It was intimidating. It wasn't worth it to me. It, it would have been very distracting. This is a very intimidating situation. Peter and John are fishermen. These guys are hoity-toities of the religion of that day. They had incredible power. They had great knowledge, misplaced albeit. They were very, very intimidating. To help you have a clear understanding how intimidating this is, just think about it. If you have George, Jay, Parker, and Philip on this side, and I'm on this side, and we're going to play Bible trivia. Great, right? And George starts off the competition. Uh, yes, I'll take Old Testament name proper pronunciation for 500 billion. I'm toast. I am toast. If anybody knows me, you know I can't say the people's names in the Old Testament. Very intimidating situation. Where are you? So you're at this waypoint. You're being encouraged. You understand what's going on. And you're making a strategy to go to the next waypoint. I believe that Peter and John, while they were sitting there, they were strategizing. They understand that what that's going to happen to them. And it says in verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired. You know, we think that we have some kind of uh, magic ability. Like you have a puppy, and you sit it down, and you say, Stay there, like it's going to stay there. You have a little kid, and you put them down, and you, you set them down. Now stay there and stop bothering your sister. You think that somehow that that's going to work. It doesn't work. It's a humiliating kind of thing. This is a humiliating thing. They set them in the midst. They took them out of that stinky prison and they just plopped them in front of this high priest, the high priestly family, the rulers, the scribes, the Sadducees, and then all the people of Israel watching. How are they going to respond to this? How would you respond? By what power or what name did you do this? Where are you? When Jesus was ministering, I believe that Peter and John and all of the apostles were not plucking grass and trying to make whistles with their thumbs. I don't think that they were doodling in the dirt while Jesus was ministering and performing miracles. I don't think they were skipping rocks on the Sea of Galilee. They were engaged. They were watching Jesus. They were learning from his example. They, they were absolutely understanding that he was going to go away and they were responsible to hold up the line. I believe that they were watching Jesus and learning from him and ready to put this to use. This is a blended effort that we're going to see. Now hear me carefully because I want to be very clear. This is all by the grace of God. But they had a responsibility. They had thought. They had an understanding. They had a clear way forward set by the example of Christ. And they also had to have God's blessing. This blended thing, think about it like David and Goliath. David knew that God had blessed him in the past. He knew he was going to bless him in the present. And he knew he was going to give him glory in the future. But he still had to pick up the rocks. He had to put them in the sling. He had to let it go. This is a blended effort that we see. And part of the example that Peter saw of Jesus is his incredible ability to discern when people are asking questions to trick him or not. Oh, you guys pay taxes? Huh? What's up with that? Jesus asked for Daenerys. Whose image is on it? Caesar. Give the Caesar what is Caesar's. Give the God what is God. He took that trick question and he turned it around in truth and he illuminated their wickedness. Right? What, what about his baptism and the power that he has to bat, uh, uh, excuse me, the, his, his power of his ministry. And Jesus took their question, which was a trick question, and he says, what about John the Baptist's baptism? Was it of God or was it of man? Uh-oh. All right, you got a problem. The problem is, if they say it's of God, why aren't they believing Jesus? If they say it's of man, the people are going to destroy him. So what happens when you confront the world with a truth that they can't get out of? They lie. So he, they said, oh, we don't know. And Jesus says, neither will I tell you. He took their trick question and he reformulated it by his truth and he illuminated their witness. Peter witnessed this and watch what happens. 
Verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, by what name did you do this? These guys are idiots. He didn't hide it. He said, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He made it clear. They're trying to trick him. And what did Peter do? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. There's that blending, right? He's not a puppet, but he knows that God is with him. And he uses his intellect. And he says, rulers of the people and elders. Now, I told you guys that this passage had been admonishing me, right? When you're in spiritual battle, right, do you give respect to the enemy? When you're telling that girl, you are murdering the baby in your womb. And she's got a sign, my body, my choice. And she's yelling all kinds of profanity at you. And she's just, just, ah. Do you give her respect? Peter did. These people could kill him. Rulers of the people and elders. That's amazing to me. And then he says, verse 9 is an example of how he learned from Christ. Have I learned from Christ? If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, guys over there, yep, leg's still working, we're good, all right? By what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you. So he's talking to the high priest. He's not intimidated by them. He's telling them the truth. The high priest, the high priestly family, the rulers, the scribes, the Sadducees, and all the people that are listening to him. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, okay, so he said it again, and you ready? Whom you crucified. We just read it on a public reading. Whom you crucified. Hey, you Sadducees, wake up, listen up. Whom God raised from the dead. This, by him, this man is standing before you well. What a great response. What a great, he took their trickery and he turned it around in truth and he gave it right back to them. Now Peter gives us a demonstration of how to do spiritual warfare. He doesn't just give them a big old salvo and then walk away like, ah, that was easy. No, he gives it to them in an oaky storm. Come in with the straight winds. Bring in some hail. Maybe pop in a couple tornadoes because he goes on. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. He said that you were going to reject him. The builders, which has become the cornerstone. He said that he was going to be a stumbling block to you because he's truth and you're not. This is awesome. And then Peter does something that I think is one of the biggest admonishments I've had from this passage yet. These people could kill him. And they're, they're just totally misunderstanding the good news. And they're humiliating him. And they're abusing their power. And what, is, what does Peter do? He gives them the gospel message. He gives his enemy the gospel. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Do I give the gospel message? You are a man. You were born a man. Stop pretending you're a woman. Stop it. Do I give them the gospel in the heat of battle? Or do I get lost in the fog of war? Peter stayed on track. This is how you have spiritual victories. It is amazing. So now we have the question, where are you going? Where is this going to lead? And we have verse 13 to the end of our passage. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. What happened? They were grounded in the truth. That kept them on track. They used the waypoints that God had blessed them with to correct their error and, and maintain a strategy to go forward, to glorify God and give him honor and glory forever and ever. And I'm thankful that Luke wrote this, that they were at least honest enough to admit, this is astonishing. These guys are coming at us with both guns. Barrels, sorry. And then another admonishment to Dave that maybe you can glean from. This is, this is the high priest. You talk about ego. This guy is it. And the high priestly family, he's got this support network. And all of these people that are around him, that are with him. And what does it say? And they recognize that they had been with Jesus. 
When I'm in spiritual battle, you can tell that I can get fired up. Do I leave the situation so that the people that I'm in battle with recognize that I've been with Jesus? Do I bring the truth and compassion? Do I have empathy to them? Do I love them? Obviously, Peter did. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Do I take Jesus' example and apply it to my life daily? Do people that I work with, rec work with recognize that I've been with Jesus? Or am I just some talking point that's annoying? But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. I think this is rather comical because this guy's over there, right? And as Peter's giving this retort, this guy comes over and I think he's just like, yeah, give it to him. And I think the people of Israel are like, this is awesome. They are giving it back to these guys. I think this is great. But when they had commanded them to lead the council, they conferred with one another. Where are you going? You know what? I don't know where I'm going. I know that God has all things in his sovereign control and I can rest in him. Where are you going? You know, when they took him away, they were high-fiving each other. We had the victory, man. We stayed true. We stayed true to the gospel and we gave it to him. This is awesome. Now who's confused? Now who's afraid of the people? 16, saying, what shall we do with these men? Oh, I don't know. For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. I think this guy's standing, yeah, I'm still good. Legs still work, I'm good. And all the people are like, yes, yes. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them all right, to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they're going to use, they're going to abuse the power that they have, and they're going to warn them not to speak anymore. They're going to cancel them. So they called them and charged the men not to speak at, or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Right. Right. Where are you going? Are you going to turn around? Are you going to just, okay, yeah, that was fun. I'm, I'm done. Where are you going? And 19 is one of the best verses I've read in a long, long time. It's up right up there in the top ten. But Peter and John answered them, you ready? Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. That is amazing. Can you not help but speak what you have seen and heard? This guy just got healed. He can be talking about that all the time. What about Lazarus? Hey, Lazarus, what was it like? I was dead. Yeah, what was it like? I was dead. And then I heard Christ say, Lazarus, come forth. And, and I was alive. And I was trying to walk, but I was all wrapped up. And then I saw Mary and Martha, and, and we hugged, and, and it was great. Wow. Do you think he's just going to say, yeah, it was kind of cool. Uh, can you hand me the ketchup? No, he's going to keep talking about that. You know, a little while ago, we were talking to a new members class, and I was explaining that Cindy and I went on a two-week vacation. And when we left, both of our garage doors were down. We came back after two weeks, and one of the garage doors was up. When did it go up? How did it go up? It's up. So we went in, and I was a little nervous. And thankfully, there was no animals living in there. And thankfully, there was no humans living in there. Everything was fine. Everything was good. There was nothing out of place. God protected us, and we didn't even know it until we got back. I can't help but keep talking about that. Well, what about that? What about the fact that I know what I was like before I got saved? I know exactly who I was. And God saved me. He saved me. I can't stop talking about that. What about us? Can we help but not talk about it? Hmm, that's good stuff right there. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. You know it. You know it. The people back there were like, yes, this is great. That's the same exact thing he said before. That's the same that he said yesterday. This is awesome. This is the truth. All men can be saved if they repent and believe. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. 
you know what? I don't know what route God has for you. I don't know what he's predestined in your life. I don't know what waypoints you're on. This poor guy, he had to wait 40 years because the way God made him in the womb was for his glory on this day. God used him to glorify his name. God can use you to glorify his name. And he gives you these spiritual battles. And how are you going to perform your warfare? So we saw three, three points of how Peter used this strategy to give him the spiritual warfare. What is up? We redefine that to say, what is truth? God's word is truth. The gospel is truth. And that will keep you straight on path. Where are you? Well, you, you have various waypoints. You know, if you come to a waypoint and you're having a problem, you're sinning, confess your sin. We just did it. The corporate confession of sin. You confess your sin and God puts you straight. And then you strategize how you're going to go from one waypoint to another. Am I going to dip back down into that temptation or am I going to stay on track? You strategize how you're going to live your life. I know what I'm headed for. This is good. Where are you? I'm on the narrow path. This is a narrow path right here. And the thing about this path is amazing. Everybody who's supposed to be on it fits. I don't know who's supposed to be on it. That's why you spread the gospel out. I just want you to repent and believe and join us. I want that thing packed. But on this narrow path, there's, there's guide rails. They're called the Ten Commandments. And it keeps you on path. And you strategize from one to the other. And as you make your progress, you want to be more like Christ. You want to have those, those, those changes in your life so that you are, I can tell you, you've been with Christ. Where are you going? I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with Jesus Christ in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more sadness, there's no more sickness, there's no more sorrow, and praise God, hallelujah, there's no more sin. I'm going to heaven. For those that are here today that are Christians, I pray that this will be an encouragement to you. Be grounded in the truth. Set the course. Follow the course. Know the course. And don't get blown off course. You're going to come into storms in this life. There's going to be people that are going to say things. There are going to be situations that are, affect you. Life happens. Stay the course. Where are you? I want you to be with me on the narrow path. Use these waypoints that God has given us. Sometimes God's, God's word tells us that his light, his word is like a lamp to my feet. My, my waypoint is one foot in front of another one. I'm human. I've been redeemed. I'm thankful that I've been saved, but I got to sometimes have little steps. Use each other. Use the church family. Use worship as a waypoint for your life. Where are you going? We got the hope of heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. For those that are here that are not Christians, I'll ask you the same question. What is up? This is up. This is up. No, this is up. You look like that goofy scarecrow on the Wizard of Oz. If I only had a brain. You can't help it. You are not grounded in truth. You don't know what up is. And you're going to get blown around by every wave of doctrine. Well, yeah, I guess there are more than two genders. No, there's not. But you can't help yourself. I know this. I was you. Where are you? Well, Dave, man, I'm on a wide path. There's no speed limit. I can go here. I can go there. I can do anything. And there is a lot of people on this path. This is great. I don't even have to use my blinkers. Well, you know what? Okay, that's where you're at. Fine. Where are you going? You are going to hell. You are going to be condemned to hell forever. That is the truth. What are you going to do? Where are you? What is up? What is truth? God's word is truth. The gospel is truth. You have to have a savior. You cannot get to heaven without repenting of your sins and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. What route are you on? 
I desperately pray that you would repent and believe and join us on the narrow path and have the hope of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the example of Peter. I thank you for helping him stay by the stuff. I thank you for the example of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would be with the saints, that you would equip them to handle the spiritual warfare that we are now in as we face not only the old man in our lives, but the culture that we live in. Help us, Lord, to strategize from waypoint to waypoint to bring glory and honor to your name. And for those that are not Christians that are here with us today or listening in, I pray that your Holy Spirit would call out that effectual call and they would step out in faith and repent and believe and join us in the hope of heaven. In your name I pray, amen.